Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Today's webinar will be about creating compelling characters in Clip Studio Paint, presented by Miki Montio. That's me. Hello, everybody. I see there Hello, are still Mickey. people uh, getting into the room, so I'll wait just a minute or two so, so yes, they sir. can end up getting in. I'm going to continue uh, giving some information and I will be right back to you. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, there are some housekeeping items I would like to share with you. The webinar will be approximately one hour long. All attendees will be muted. Question and answer session will be during the last 15 minutes of the webinar. Attendees can ask questions in the GoToWebinar question box right away. Due to time constraints, not all questions will be answered. The webinar will be recorded. The recording will be shared on social media and will be sent via email to all registrants and attendees. The panelists for this webinar are Mario Quinones, myself, Joanna Brower, and Miki Montio. For those of you who join us for the very first time or have never heard about Clip Studio Paint, Clip Studio Paint is your only one solution for stunning, ready to publish illustrations, comics, manga, and animations. Learn more at clipstudio.net forward slash n and graphicsly.com. Also, we'd like to remind you that we will be sharing your Instagram stories if you tag us. So tag us as hashtag webinar at Mickey Monjo, at Graphicsly, at Wacom, and at Clip Studio Official. Mickey is originally from Barcelona and spent a few years working on storyboards for TV advertising, designing characters and background for video games and animation, and doing concept, concept art for feature films. Mickey then moved to Ireland to work at Cartoon Saloon Animation Studios and also started to work on his comic book series, Worship Jolly Roger. Later, he moved to the rising Chinese comic market where he adapted Providing to Humanity from best-selling writer Xichin Liu. His comics are being translated to several languages and he keeps collaborating with animation studios such as Laika, Cartoon Saloon, or Jendi Tartakovsky. So with that, I will leave you with Mickey and his presentation, Creating Compelling Characters in Clip Studio Paint. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, welcome to the webinar and thank you so much for joining and spending a few minutes with us tonight. Uh, I have very limited time here, so uh, I'm going to try to be as quick as I can, just to show you some brief concepts of how it work. And um, I'll be sharing my screen with Clip Studio Paint, which is mainly what I used to uh, work these days. Uh, since uh, I started working on my characters with, with Photoshop years ago, but uh, a couple of years ago, I switched to Clip Studio, seeing that the program gave me a lot more advantages to uh, work on my comics. So I'm currently working on, on a new Wonder Woman comic. It's my first time doing superheroes, and um, I've been drawing a lot of warriors lately, so I thought it would be good to do something like that tonight. So I prepared this little sketch, so uh, you can see more or less what's uh, the workflow. And uh, if you have any questions, you want to work, uh, you want to ask something in particular, uh, please let me know or let Mario know so he can ask me. And uh, Mario, for you too, uh, feel free to to interrupt me anytime if if there's something uh, they want to ask. So let's go with it. First of all, uh, just very briefly about my brushes. I've been working with default brushes for uh, most of my professional career. I'm not, I've never been the kind of uh, artist that gets really deep into brushes. And uh, lately I've been using a lot of this one called Yeti Rough Brush, which is a free brush you can very easily find on the internet. Just Google it and you'll find it for sure. And I really like it because it, it gives you a very rough, very organic line. So this is mostly what I'm using. And for inking, you'll see that I very often use a big brush and I use pressure a lot to try to create the kind of line that I need for it. And if 
in case you were wondering, I'm using a, a Cintiq Wacom 24HD Touch to work with Clip Studio. So let's go. Um, before starting, very briefly, just saying that when I ink, I need to have in mind where's the light coming from. Um, uh, like drawing, as you probably know, it's mostly a task of, of planning. So even though I only have a sketch at this point, I need to plan how this drawing is going to look at the end. So I need to sort of visualize on my head like what this is going to look like so I can figure out things like values and light on a very early stage of the of the of the piece and for that experience I would say it's it's a very very important tool. So this is actually not even my first sketch. I did a very, very basic one. As you can see, this is the very early stage of, of a sketch. Normally I do this in, in about two, five minutes, something like that. And sometimes I get into something a bit more detailed. Tonight I wanna make sure that we do something cool here. So I had to get into a, a bit more of a, a bit more of a detailed sketch. So let's go, let's start a bit. Uh, again, light will be coming from here. Keep in mind that we're working on a three dimensional space. So light is not flat or is not coming from one side like this or this, but it has a 3D um, sense on it. Thanks for mentioning graphics, Lee. <laughs> let's go. So you'll see that I'm using again a big brush and and trying to use variety on the line it's not going to be a perfect inking again i have very limited time here and i want to make sure that i get into at least an early stage of coloring so i'll go as quick as i can which will probably lead to a more rough inking as you can see i'm working in very very straight quick lines because I want the uh, inking to be energetic. I want it to be uh, really, I want the lines to flow and I don't want to do like shaky short lines. If you see when, when you go slow, you get, you, maybe you don't notice that much, but with the marrow pen, if you do a slow line, you, you get weird variations on the size of the brush. But if you do quick lines, you get very nice energetic, energetic lines like this so i've been working all day so that means that i'm already warm up but sometimes it's good before start working to you know just do a bit of lines on an empty canvas so you can warm up a bit let's go like on my first comics i remember that i was getting really obsessed on trying to have a really clean perfect line i was using i was using the um the marrow pen uh brush for it mostly and i remember i was waiting a lot i was wasting a lot of time to try to have a, a really clean perfect line and um that was really stressful uh, like comic doing comics is, is stressful in general sometimes but trying to get that clean light uh was was really really it was really time wasting and and at the end it was not really that worth it because the sketches sometimes they they would lose a bit of energy so then i started to use more organic brushes like this one like the uh yeti rock brush i just told you and uh i really speeded up my process and i ended up really liking more the results see if you if you um zoom in you'll see that the ink is far from being perfect you can zoom in a bit maybe clean it up a bit but now i never get obsessed with it it's all about keeping the raw energy of the initial sketch And the kind of inking I do, I uh, do normally I do a very clear line, 
but now I'm trying to work more and more with bigger um, stains of ink and, and using black uh, ink a bit more to, to make nicer compositions. But before that, I, I used to, to work only in clear line. Now that I'm working on, on, on American comics, I'm just trying to learn from the techniques that uh, American artists uh, used to use for their comics. So I'm, I'm using a bit more of a, of a, a bit more of black ink on, on all my inking. There we go. Normally, I I start working on the face. I think the reason is probably that I know that uh, that's where the audience is going to look at first. Normally, we have a natural tendency to look at faces. So uh, I want to make sure before uh, before I start working on the rest of the drawing that the face works and looks nice. So that's probably the reason. I and, and if I have a close up, normally I start working on the eyes before working on anything else. Now that the face is done and it works, I know that I can start working all the rest of the drawing. See that I use a lot of variation on, on the lines I use darker lines and uh, I mean thicker lines for all the parts that are not affected by this 3D light we were talking about. I know uh, beforehand that there's going to be slight shadows here so I try to use a thicker line whatever this is not affected. The logic is really simple. It's this logic. So if we know this we know that every line on this level it's going to look thicker. It's just this brought to a more complex uh, shape, but that's pretty much the idea. I remember at school I had a, um, a teacher. It was not a great teacher, but uh, he gave me some, some good advice at some point. I remember when I was struggling um, with uh, painting, because I, I never painted anything until I was about 18, 19, and I never used Photoshop or Clip Studio until then. And he told me, um, he told me something like, if you don't know how to paint, don't try to use a million colors. Use two colors. Once you learn how to paint with two colors, then try three, try three colors and keep going. And I tried that, and it was really useful for me because um, I think that a very common problem for beginner artists is that they wanna, they wanna emulate. Uh, the work of people who's been working for years and, and they know the tools and they know how to manage themselves with those tools and the result is very often a mess. So I, I took that advice and it really worked for me and I think it can work for, for beginner artists and if you, feel, if you feel lost and you feel overwhelmed by color or inking, just try to keep things simple and that usually works. Once you know how to manage simple things, just start complicating uh, complicating them. I know it's very obvious advice, but it, it does work. It worked for me. And here you can see like silhouette on the drawing is, is really important. If, if we had this drawing in just black and white silhouette, it would be very recognizable, like with a positive, negative, um, shape of it you could even understand the drawing without without any line on it just by seeing the silhouette and that's a really important idea because that means that your brain will instantly identify what's going on here so that's that's exactly what we're looking for in a in a character design like this we want to we want the audience to instantly recognize that they're looking at a warrior and with a shape of the armor and everything and the sword, 
it can be instantly recognizable from the very, very early silhouette process of it. So working with shapes, it's, it's a really important thing to learn. See, anatomy is there, but it's very, very simplified. I'm not a big, um, a big expert on on anatomy, but of course, like to do character design, I had to learn very basics about like skeleton and muscles and all that stuff. But you see that it's not a super detailed anatomy. It's just there. I just insinuate the shapes with the lines. And that's pretty much it. Okay, the hand's gonna be a bit tricky. I did a very, very rough sketch here. So let's hope this works. I don't really wanna get stuck on the hands. So first of all, I'm gonna draw this one that it's on top. And again, trying to simplify them might be a good idea. Well, not too bad. Don't really use hatching a lot, but sometimes I do these little thingies. Kind of works for, for basic shading. So let me see this other hand is coming out from here. Well, kind of, more or less, could be better, but I think we'll have to go with it. Okay. And again, it's, it's, the inking really changes for depending what you're doing. If you're doing, let's say, a pinup or something that will go on screen for a video game, you're probably going to have to make sure that you do a really clean inking. For something like this, even for my daily job doing comics, I think that something like this should be more than enough to, to go for a final ink. And I remember when I was starting on comics that I used to look at the work of um, veteran artists and, and really wondering, like, how could they reach that level of, you know, uh, simplification? How could they do such powerful inking? And um, I've been working for about six, seven years doing comics now. And after a while, I realized that um, apart from experience, of course, it was pressure. Like the more pressure you have, um, the more you have to come up with clever um, solutions to save time. 
and um, of course you have to try to apply enough pressure to yourself to keep you um, to keep you uh, awake and to keep you alert but just enough pressure for that but not enough to break yourself as an artist like sometimes artists they tend to be really harsh with themselves and um, that's not really good in most of cases you know mental health and all that most of the time we're just we're just uh, lonely people working alone in a room so we have to make sure that we have a good understanding with ourselves so uh, pressure it's really good to keep you motivated but make sure you know yourself and you know how much pressure you can handle and if you feel like it's not feeling well learn that sometimes you need to stop for a while before getting back to battle all right we got the sword got it i'm gonna be working in the rest of the silhouette and now i'm gonna use a a bit more of a thinner line for the rest of the detail and we're gonna go for um we're gonna go for flat colors in a couple of minutes. I want to show you at least that early stage of, uh, of painting, just to to show you what's my usual process for it. Like sometimes it's it's changing. Sometimes I go for flat colors at first. Sometimes I start working on I start working on shading. It it depends, but at the end it's all part of the same logic. Just a bit more of anatomy here. That's it. And you know, here we could really get very, very crazy with tones of details and all that. We're not gonna do that tonight, but we could really spend a lot of time here working on you know clothing. Uh, using references for it. I did this one without reference, but uh, very often I get asked if I use reference and the short answer is yes, I use as much reference as I can. And this is, again, something that has changed a lot from my uh, early years working as an artist. Um, for some reason, and I think this is very common, I used to think that I had to work only with my memory and um you know like if you ever tried like most of the people is not really good at drawing cars and and trucks and vehicles of any kind so just try to draw a, a bike by memory unless you're really an expert about bikes it's probably going to be a mess so at the end i had to admit that uh, using reference was a very useful thing to do now i have no problem on using reference and i use it as much as i can even i use like 3d programs like SketchUp or SketchFab where there's huge 3D libraries and um, I tend to use um, those models for um, building scenes uh, any any kind of stuff that I have to to do I um I tend to work a lot in um, in 3D now 
because you know like characters like this like 3d is is not not really useful because you want to have dynamic poses and all that but for buildings vehicles things like that i would say it's a super useful tool and all comic artists know it maybe kim jung ji is the only guy that still doesn't use reference or 3d but all of the rest of mortals we we do have to use it we have limited memory and uh and we we tend to have to use reference got it i think we're gonna leave the line like this we're gonna do a bit of flat coloring and maybe a bit of shading so yeah let's start i think i'll, I'll start with the shading here so first of all, I'm going to do a selection. I'm going to select the empty space around the character or the negative space if you want. Let's do something first. I'll do a gray layer so you can clearly see what I'm doing. Gray layer that is going to affect the whole canvas, just a flat color. And now I'm going to select the empty space what i'm doing here is is telling uh, csp if i want the magic wand to affect to the whole canvas or only um or on or only the layer i'm working in okay got the selection i'm gonna add the selection as well oh sorry had to press this first, sorry. Again, selection. Got it, and I'm gonna invert this selection. No, sorry, I'm gonna leave it as it was because I'm gonna do a white layer around the character so I can work underneath. Right? Okay, okay, got it. So now we have a blank layer all around the character, right? And then we have the character underneath. Let's do a bit of shading now. Just gonna take a minute to decide which brush I'm gonna use. I'm, I'm trying a lot of new brushes now lately. It's now that after 15 years working professionally that I'm starting to uh, to investigate a bit on, on um, brushes i got a couple of uh of uh, free packs that i found on the internet well i think this one i bought it it's a really good one it's called d-a-u-b um, i bought it i think it was like five bucks or something like that very useful it it has really good organic brushes i think it's called the watercolors so I'm investigating now a bit. So uh, I take a minute or two to decide which brush, depending on the result I want, I'm gonna use here. So this one is pretty rough. This one could work. Yeah, this will work, something like this. See, again, just trying to get a nice organic brush. So I'm gonna use this one. And I'm gonna work, I'm gonna treat materials in a, in a slightly different uh, way. First of all, I'm gonna do one pass of general shading. And on the second pass, I'm gonna start working on materials and textures. So let's go, I'm gonna create a new layer. Maybe I'm gonna Low down the opacity a bit because I don't want these to go, uh, the shadows to go pure black. So I'm going to start working a bit. Again, remember where light was coming from. I'll try to keep that in mind to apply the right amount of shading. I'm gonna start with the obvious, um, with the more obvious shadows. These are called if you don't know the own shadows, which means the shadows that uh, the object casts on itself, not on other 
uh, objects. So the sort of armor that she has around the face has own uh, shadows like this. Again, gonna have to go pretty quick since we, well, we still have a couple of minutes, but I really wanna have time to show you. So see the the shadows on the face are not really super strong. Wanted to keep that really simple because the line it's it's enough for it to work. So I don't really want to distort line a lot. So it's going to be a basic, very basic shading here. In, in case you've seen any of my videos on um, YouTube or Patreon, again, you'll see that I don't always follow the same, the exact same process. As I was saying before, sometimes I start with flat coloring, sometimes I start with shading. It really depends on, on what kind of drawing I, uh, I'm working in and what do I want to get. But at the end, the idea is exactly the same. So don't get obsessed with having a particular logic on your process, but try to work on a process that really makes sense and it's efficient and it saves time and it doesn't cause you headaches every time you try to understand why shadows work as they do. And again, don't try not to zoom in too much because it's really easy when you're working digitally to uh, completely lose perspective of what you're doing. Especially in comics more than illustration, when um, in comics you're working with, uh, you're working with a lot of small drawings in one single page. So it's, it's a very common problem, especially when you're a beginner that you try to fill everything with details and you completely lose track of the size of objects and uh, of basically anything you're doing. See, for example, this one is a cast shadow. This iron object here is casting a shadow on the stomach of the character. So this would be called a cast shadow in case you didn't know the difference between own and cast shadows. Uh, just to, to keep it really simple, this is the own shadow. This is the cast shadow, okay? Let's keep going. I think we're gonna have 10 good minutes for coloring. Let's see how far I can go with this. And this is also a cast shadow of the um, sword on the character. I think it could be a bit more like here. This is the cast shadow of the sword on the character. And it really, cast shadows, uh, they're really useful to uh, allow us to understand space by drawing or painting this cast shadow on the character. We are indicating where the sword is located in space.
So see, we have this. Now we're going to do a second pass really quick on materials because I want to add a bit of texture to some of the materials here, starting with the armor. And normally when when I when I do this black and white work on the character before painting, I use um, I use a slightly different technique than I normally use on uh, on my comics, which is that instead of uh, painting colors and then uh, casting the light over them, I just color the whole uh, the whole painting or the whole let's say uh, grayscale and then I keep switching the colors until I get a result that I find useful. Now again I use different methods for painting this is just one of the ones I use not necessarily the most efficient so don't don't get super obsessed with it uh, there's no particular way to work there's just an infinite ways to get to the, the very same solution. Right, so now I'm going a bit deeper into values. So I probably will want to use this on the final color version. So I'm gonna do another layer of very, very general lighting. Like this one will not have detail at all it's just going to be a few touches of airbrush because basically i want to focus the attention on this part of the character but again here we could try a lot of different ways to cast um to cast light and shadow on the character for example if we wanted to focus the attention on the sword we could go and do something like this so this could work perfectly, just would be a different idea. In fact, I think we're going to go with something like this. Now the face, it's important, but I want to I wanna try what happens if I focus more interest on the sword. So let's clean this clean cut a bit, making it fit with the rest of the inking. Right, and finally, now that we're here, I'm gonna work a bit more on the lights this time. I'm gonna create a different value for the crown, if we can call it like that, the crown she's wearing. I'm gonna add some extra lights before I give it a few touches of color. With materials like this, with uh, shiny materials like golden, silver, a really important thing to do is to make sure that uh, you have you have very very high contrast on it, right? So we have to make sure that um, that there's very high values in opposition to really dark ones, like I'm doing here. Okay, we're just gonna add a few extra lights. 
to finish with this. Some points where light is bouncing. And we're gonna start painting a tiny bit because we, well, we still have a few minutes left, but I really wanna have time for the Q&A. So let's make this real quick. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, you see I've done a lot of layers here. You can merge them or you can put them in a folder in case you're not sure about merging them. So you can clean, uh, you can work in a, in a more tidy, cleaner way, right? So what I'm gonna do underneath this layer, I'm gonna create a new one and I'm gonna use color so I could use different effects here. Let's try with color. So I can give a one flat color to everything that I have here underneath the white layer. Got it. Now we're gonna use this as a base tone for it. I want a, a really earthy tone for this. Okay, got it. And now what we can do, we can start creating layers with different effects to give a slight different color to every material. Here, for example, let's try to use overlay, which is a, a light effect. It's, it's one of the ones I use the most to try to give this a more golden tone. So the main idea of this is that you keep the values you've been using in black and white, but you color the layers individually until you get something that you find interesting. The good thing is that here we can still work with values since we can use multiply or overlay effects that change the nature of the values here, but we already have a good guide of how do we want to work with light. Gonna use one single layer for every different material. Gonna work on the skin now. I'm gonna use overlay again. Again, these colors are way too saturated, but we still have uh, all the layers and plenty of time to work on them. So it's, it's still not a relevant thing to think about. See here, the color, it doesn't even seem to appear since the values are way, way higher. But still, we'll figure it out later. Got it. Now that we have this, we can work with saturation until we get the tone we want for the skin. We can even block this layer and use the airbrush to give it uh, glimpses of, of red here, for example, or here in the chicks or the ears or the parts of the body that tend to accumulate more blood, right? Let's keep working a bit more. 
uh, she could have red hair. So let's make a new layer. Again, same process. And uh, where is it? Multiply. Overlay. Multiply up here. Got it. Let's use this red to paint some other parts. See, I'm, it's a bit of a messy painting here. I'm going really a bit too quick. Maybe I was too ambitious. I want to do too many things in, in, in a very limited time, but I hope you, you'll understand the main idea of this. Actually, let's go back to, to this layer so the bracelets can be same color. And I think we're actually running out of time for the session and I wanna have time for the Q&A. So uh, Mario, uh, let me know when should I stop and, uh, and uh, leave time for the Q&A. Um, how about we, you keep drawing, and we'll okay. ask on the side. We'll we'll ask all the questions on the side. That's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We, because we have so many questions. Okay. It's always, we have so many questions. So let's try to get through as many as we can. Okay. Um, is there is there a lot of uh, which brush do you use? There is, and people are trying <laughs> to find the the rough the Yeti brush, but it seems a bit difficult. So if you have that later on, maybe if you remember. But yeah, just. We hope okay. everyone Googles it, and if you could share it somewhere, like on your social media, that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, so. I'll do something. I'll do a, a public post on my Patreon, so you can find it there and download yeah. it. So uh, I think it's it's probably the easiest way, since there I can put the link to my Dropbox. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. So I think everyone okay. will be really happy about it because just watching your process and just seeing how everything is getting done so quickly is just amazing. So <laughs> people are like, we want the brush, the magic brush that Mickey uses. <laughs> um, okay, let's get into the questions. Um, when you get uh, references for your characters, what's the most important thing you usually keep in mind when working with characters? When I gather the references, what, what I try to do is like, first of all, have a very specific idea of what I want to do with a character. Um, you know, like I, I have a couple of folders that that I feel with um, with um, paintings, references, stuff. When I when I get a bit lost or I don't know what to do, I tend to go to those folders and see what's in there. So sometimes ideas uh, come up to mind, but um, when I'm working on a specific character, I always try to have a clear idea of what I want to do first. So uh, the references I gather are more like a support for, for example, uh, now I'm working on Wonder Woman. So I have to draw a lot of swords, a lot of bows, a lot of weapons, a lot of armors. And I, well, I live in Spain. We don't wear armors or carry <laughs> here. So normally, at least I don't. So uh, I don't really have any idea of of how a bow really is or how a sword really is. But I'm pretty sure that once uh, people read my comic, there's going to be even a small minority of the uh, audience will will have knowledge about how swords and and weapons and bows really are. So when I draw them, I want these people to feel that they're seeing something real. It's almost like you're directing a movie and I don't know, the actors are carrying guns and stuff like that. And you wanna know that the people who see the movie and know something about guns, uh, you don't wanna lose them. You wanna feel like they're seeing something real. Mm -hmm. So it's the same, like you have an initial idea with a character but you need a lot of 
visual support to know how to draw these things that you've only seen in movies. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, is there anything you really don't like to draw? Um, something I don't like to draw. The thing is, uh, I love robots, but I hate drawing them. <laughs> because, yeah, I love them, and I love other people seeing uh, drawing, uh, seeing drawing them robots. But um, it, the problem with robots is that when you draw them, you want them to seem that they work. So all the pieces have to fit in, and once you draw them once, you have to draw them the same way all the time, which means like having always a reference in front of you. Poof, so it's it's really tricky to me. Drawing people and expressions, it's the easiest because it's the thing that I see the most in my yeah. in my daily life. Yeah. Do you have any specific inspiration for robots when you have to draw them? For robots, I think it might seem funny, but I think a lot on the on the kind of funny robots that uh, the author of Dragon Ball used to draw because. Huh. Um, <laughs> I remember that when I was a kid, I I would love the robots he would draw on his mangas, and uh, that would be like super simple but super eye catchy. So I tried to keep that in mind, huh. and um, and I really like the work that um, uh, I think he's from Australia. The artist Ashley Woods does on his robots because he he seems to work in a way that. Um, it, it doesn't really get obsessed with details or mechanisms or anything. Mm. You just have fun with them. So that's that's something that I try to keep in mind when when I when I draw them, which yeah. luckily is not very often. At least now drawing uh, drawing this comic Wonder Woman comic, I don't really have yeah. to draw. Them. <laughs> not so many robots in that one. <laughs> not really. Yeah. Uh, speaking of your comic work, like how much time do you usually spend? Uh, working on the comics, like in a day. Uh, that's a that's a tricky question because um, it like the time I invest on on the comics really changed through the years. Mm. I would say that um, oh, just to give you an idea, on the first comic I I was working six seven years ago, the first Worship Jolly Roger, it took me a year and a half to draw and paint. 54 pages. Oh, so wow, yeah. Uh, that, yeah, that was that was especially for American standards. That's mm. a lot of time. In 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 maybe in European market, it, it can be more normal. Still, still mm. I was slow, but for uh, American standards, it's very very slow. So uh, last year I finished the um, the comic uh, the uh, Chinese adaptation for uh, Fixing Liu, Providing for Humanity. And uh, that was 120 pages, and I was painting, uh, drawing, painting, inking, doing everything again. And for 120 pages, it took me the same time as it took mm. for the first one. And I would say this last one uh, has a lot more detail and and, yeah. uh, and 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 has more work on it. So that means mm. that I probably increased my speed per two or three in the last six, seven years. So yeah. That's that's probably what I got from from the experience drawing comics, but at the same time, it really really depends on the, um, on the kind of comic you're working in, on the detail you put on it, on what I'm doing now on the Wonder Woman comic. Ideally, it would take me two days, two days and a half to finish a page from scratch. That is uh, storyboarding, compositing. Drawing, hmm. inking, and painting. Okay, and then you talk about like eight-hour day, ten-hour day, more. <laughs> <laughs> Again, that's 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 another tricky question. I made a, a joke on 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 my Instagram a couple of of weeks ago about like what's the normal timeline for my day, and since hmm. I'm freelancing, it's it's uh, very tricky to calculate because hmm. you know there's always things to do at home. Like maybe you yeah. wake up and uh, you need to have breakfast, but the kitchen is a mess, so you start cleaning, and then you get to work an hour late, and uh, then something happens, you, then you're hungry again, but then someone, <laughs> a client calls, and you thought it was going to be a 10-minute call, but it ends up being an hour and a half. Oh, so, uh, 
Yeah, so uh, lately it's very difficult to have like consistent eight hours of work. Mm. Um, what I try to do now is whenever I sit down and I have like two hours of solid work, I try to I try to go as fast as I can, to be <laughs> honest. So I would say very rarely I work eight hours a day on a comic. Mm. Uh, it's closer to five, six hours a day. And uh, then the rest of the time is for drawings that i do for myself or uh, maybe you know like checking social media which is something that i don't really spend a lot of time but you know if if you have facebook instagram art station whatever it's already you know a lot of stuff to do so yeah yeah and so you do still draw for yourself like oh, you yeah. still draw yeah. as a hobby absolutely yeah and and i have to be careful with that because it's it's taking a lot of of my uh of my time for professional work so mm. um it's something that that i need to be careful with because for example on you know on october a lot of artists do this inktober thing uh yeah like normally i i do my own list and when i'm planning it it's always like well this is gonna be fun you know it's gonna take me half an hour a day and then once I get into it, I, I I usually get carried away, and instead of half an hour, end up being like two hours, three hours, <laughs> and uh, then people start commenting things, and I start I want to reply their comments. So yeah, I I draw a lot for myself, and it's something that I'm I'm very careful with because I know firsthand um, from many artists friends that once you stop doing that. You kind of lose some page, some passion for for mm. drawing. You you kind of like start understanding that everything is work. And to mm. me, uh, I I transformed this hobby in my um, in my work and my passion and my source of income. But I really want to keep the spirit of you know drawing in in high school where when I had to be studying something else in in some sort of way i feel like i'm i'm still doing the same a mm. lot of days i'm supposed to work but i'm spending the whole morning drawing something for me because i got carried away and it and somehow it, it still feels like i'm hiding from the teacher you know it's just yeah. that the, the teacher <laughs> yeah the teacher is now in myself you know it's in my head somehow yeah Oh gosh, yeah. I'm I'm sure that a lot of artists struggle with that. So, especially with time. But you're so quick. Like just watching your progress now, it's like you managed to do all of this in just like barely under an hour. So it's always hard to imagine like what the what the actual workflow of an artist is and how much time they have for their own work yeah. in a day. It's tricky, so, you know. Like for yeah. for the kind of work I do. Um, I know there's artists that they do one thing and they do it better than anyone and uh, they are really loyal to that style in particular and the timing and everything like i'm not the, that kind of guy like if you give me a job and um and instead of let's say 10 days you give me two uh, instead of thinking like well this is going to be stressful which is probably going to be what I think is like, okay, like it's up to you. Like in two days, I'm going to be able to go as far as I can. But if you pay me the same for working 10 days uh, or two, I might rather work two and then rest for the rest of, of the time mm -hmm. that I have, you know? Mm -hmm. So I always try to adapt my workflow to what I'm doing. Like tonight, I know I had 45 minutes, so I wanted to have something finished. It's probably not going to be my best work, but... Uh, I manage it to show big part of the process, which is what I intended to. So yeah. I'm happy with it, you know. And I think it's very impressive too. So I'm I'm sure everyone's really happy with what you showed of your progress. So it's really I'm glad. Yeah, really hope cool. so. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's wrap this up real quick. Um, with two more questions. Um, what are you currently drawing on? Like your your setup for the for your work. Your computer you're working on a mac i see uh, yeah your tablet. I'm, I'm working actually i should renew my my work setup i'm working <laughs> uh um macbook from 2005 no no oh, 2005 wow. that's too, way too long 2015 i think so 2015, not that bad. Yeah. 
that's pretty yeah, pretty but, long ago too though <laughs> yeah yeah i'm starting to have problem like updating my programs and stuff so i'll probably have to renew it soon yeah. i'm working with a macbook pro i'm working with a uh, wacom cintiq uh, 24 hd touch mm. and then i have in front of me an extra screen uh, a really old uh macbook from 2000 2011 no it's not a macbook it's an imac from 2011 mm. with a big screen where i used to display references or watch shows listen to podcasts and do backup uh savings for all the words i have here yeah okay um yeah. and then one last thing um any advice for people who would like to get into comic into the comic industry or just start drawing comics as a total beginner what do you need to do <laughs> <laughs> well you need you need to do a lot of things and uh for for everyone is different so there's no one straight path into it mm. first thing i would recommend is um is very be very careful with what you're trying to do on the first hand like try first of all if if you want to make comics you first have to survive right and yeah. on the kind of world we're living in to survive you're probably going to need some money so first of all make sure that you have a stable um, source of income so you can have some money to keep going and try to find a couple of hours every day to work on your comics because i've seen a lot of people like risking everything to one card and saying like it's going to be comics or nothing and i've seen you know like many of, of those plans going wrong i would say that that's a very romantic idea and in movies it tends to work but in real life after two years trying to get into the comic industry two three years having no money having no income and having no feedback of any kind from publisher that's usually uh, psychologically devastating so hmm. make sure you make an easy way for yourself. My advice would be try to find a job on something related to drawing, or at least that's what I did. Try to find a job on something related to drawing that uh, in the best of cases, it allows you to improve on your drawing and on your extra time uh, at home or whenever you can, try to invest time on comics and develop your ideas. A very good idea nowadays and something that I would definitely like to explore more in the near future is web comics. When when I started doing uh, comics, web, web comics, well, I think they were existing already, but they were not that popular. Like mm. now you'll have a good idea and do a good web comic. People will read it. People will love it. And you don't have to go through all the... Uh, you know the bureaucracy and showing it to the publisher and relying on a publisher that maybe it doesn't have the the same um, understanding of comics as yourself you know what i mean like yeah uh i know a lot of publishers some of them are really good but sometimes you can find yourself in the situation that you're showing you're let's say 20 years old and you're showing your work to a 55 year old person who had a very successful career as a publisher but still a bit stuck in the past so mm. the internet it's it's a really powerful tool that gives you the uh, chance to skip all that bureaucracy skip publishers and go straight to the public if i was i'm, I'm 37 years old now but if i was 20 again i would go straight into web comics mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, it's a good it's a good opportunity to get first feedback and just see what people think of your stories, Absolutely. right? Without a lot of without a lot of risk involved if you do it as a hobby. First. Exactly. You get real time feedback and you know if if you learn how to read the reaction of your audience, you know what you're doing wrong, you know what you're doing right. And um and who knows? Like we've seen a lot of movie and series adaptations from popular web comics lately. So it seems it's a good path to to learn and to hopefully thrive doing comics. Yeah. Any plans of your own to have like a separate web comic that's just yours? I would love to do that. The the only problem that I have now is time. Uh, yeah. I have very limited time, 
and uh, more and more, you know, like as as you grow up, you have more responsibilities and uh, bills to pay and things to do and, uh, <laughs> and stuff. So yeah, I would love to have uh, 48 hour days and spend uh, the extra time on developing my own web comic. But it's yeah. a mix of it's a mix of lack of time and uh, fear of the unknown, you know, yeah. because when 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 you have to create something of your own, it that always creates a lot of insecurity. So mm. it's also a good excuse as an adult to say what I just said. You know, I have to pay the bills, so I'm gonna go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go first to do the job I'm getting paid for instead of the job I would really love to do something of my own. But you know, like I did it once with my first comic, maybe I was a bit younger, a bit more uh, uh, un unconscious or whatever I was. <laughs> but I, I feel like I um, I can do it a second and a third time. I just need to find a bit of stability and mm -hmm. uh, and go for it. It's been two really crazy years with uh, you know everything that has been going on and pandemics, everyone yeah. being very anxious. So I felt like it was time to create something a bit less heavy, like the the yeah. quarantine drawings I did or the Inktober's I did these last two years, where it was all of my own writings and drawings, but mm -hmm. it was it was not something that I really had to stop and sit down and and write a, a long script or yeah. something like that. Okay. All right. Well, maybe maybe sometime in the future, when magically more time appears for everyone, who knows? <laughs> um, thank you so much for showing us your process. It was absolutely amazing to watch you draw and uh, see how you approach your designs. Um, it was a fantastic session. And Mario's going to take over now. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Joanna. Thanks for your help. Thank you so much, Joanna. Uh, uh, there were so many questions today, which is uh, an indicator that people were so interested in your presentation, Miki. So it was uh, really astonishing to see your creation, creative process. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. And just uh, remind uh, the people who are uh, here that uh, I'll be posting uh, in a few minutes the brush on uh, public post on my Patreon so they can download it there and if they have any questions maybe they can send me a, a message uh, in there as well yes for sure so one last bit of information learn more about clip studio paint in our website clipstudio.net forward slash n and graphicsly.com a reminder that this webinar has been recorded and will be uploaded to our youtube channel clip studio paint channel and graphicsly and for more information about mickey and stay connected with him the same connectivity with Mickey and his projects. I follow him on social media, Instagram, Mickey on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, our station, and also look for him on his Patreon. So to wrap it up, thanks again, Mickey. Thanks again, Joanna. Thank you so much, Mario and Joanna. And thank you everyone for coming. Thank you too. Yeah, thank you so much for everybody who joined us today. And we hope to see you in our next events. So stay tuned in our social media. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone.